The period of time between 2000 and 2005 could also be easily called a warm era. This period was probably the most prolific in terms of both number of different worm families as well as overall number of infections with worms. Let's talk about how exactly network worms and email works work. There are multiple types of network worms. The most dangerous one and the one which we can also call zero click is exploit based worms. Those type of worms didn't require any user interaction at all to infect the machine. As soon as one machine is getting infected, the worm would usually search for the new IP addresses, either in local network or on internet, and try to use the exploit to infect all vulnerable machines. As soon as the next machine is exploited, this machine will also start to search for IP addresses to infect. You can imagine that worms spread in exponential speed and some of the worms spread all over the internet in matter of hours or even minutes. There were a few other type of worms, peer-to-peer -peer worms which were abusing Kaza, a peer-to-peer -peer network to spread, as well as most of the worms would have a shared folder functionality where they would try to copy themselves into a shared folder on the computer, copy themselves into a, a folder which specific application like FTP uses to share files. The easiest way to explain network worms would be through some hypothetical example. In this case, we have uh, two organizations, organization A and organization B, with the two local networks, one on the left side, another on the right side, and in the middle there is an internet. So attack would originate somewhere on the internet and in case of the network worms back in the day most of the network worms would be attacking web servers especially if we're talking about the network worms in a pure form which would use exploit to exploit vulnerability right so that would would send a malicious quest into a web server with exploit and at that point of time it could be Windows 2000 IIS 5 exploit um, which have some remote code execution for example exploit and the attacker would scan the internet right and would send uh, waves of attacks to find the server when the code is executed on a web server and the web server gets compromised there are multiple options. The simplest one, it's a simple deface, it compromises the web server, it substitutes uh, the HTML uh, content on the pages with some sort of messages about the hacker or about the world, about whatever is on the hacker's mind. Th that's one way. Another way is that after the execution, the more advanced network worm would actually start to look into local network and try to infect other machines internally. It might be based on the shared folders where the worm would copy itself into location, writable location of the shared folder on the, on the network, which would be plenty at that time, or it could find another machine in the local network which it can compromise. For example, if the network consist of multiple web servers, it would compromise other uh, local web servers as well. So that would, that would how most typical network worms work uh, back in the day. While talking about network worms of that era, I think it's very important to mention Quadred because that was actually one of the first worms which would be fully fileless. And what that would mean, uh, that worm would attack IIS 5 on Windows 2000. It would send and explore it with buffer overflow in it to web servers. Buffer overflow were ridiculously easy to do. There were no, pretty much no prevention against buffer overflow, no canary values, nothing, no compiler support for that. That's why those type of vulnerabilities were extremely dangerous. What that worm would do, it would send the request and instead of dropping, you know, executing the file or something like that, it would actually execute in memory of IIS process and then execute the payload as well in that memory and that payload would start looking for other machines to attack. And of course it would not know in advance which machines are Windows 2000 with IIS 5, so it would just try to search and attack 
all the available machines it can. Uh, because it was fileless, it was all impossible to detect on the disk. And as I mentioned before, all anti-malware product would be very file-centric at that time. And that's why the code red and the first fileless malware, right? You now hear, oh, fileless malware is a problem. And you start looking into history and that like, probably start from PowerShell and all of that stuff and WMI. But in reality, the, the fully fileless malware and worms would be actually a problem even in, in 2000s. The email worms would be not a notable class of malware. We could split the all email worms in two categories. First category is the worms which relied on Microsoft Outlook to spread. Uh, most of those worms would be written in uh, script language such as Visual Basic script language or Visual Basic for macro in our Microsoft Office. When such worm would land on a computer, it would open Microsoft Outlook, search for the contact information, and would resend the copy of itself using Microsoft Outlook to all the contacts it found. The advantage of such worms is that they didn't need SMTP engine being built inside, and they could also use a mail server which already set up for Microsoft Outlook. So they could be very small in size and very unsophisticated. The next generation of email worms would be a binary based email worms with SMTP engine built inside. When such worm lands on a computer, instead of just searching in Microsoft Outlook, it actually will search all the files on the computer with the specific extensions to try to find a new email addresses to spread itself. After to identify the list of the email addresses, it will take the host name one by one and it will do a DNS query, specific DNS query, called MX, to receive the IP address of the mail server it need to communicate to send email to that recipient. After it knows the IP address, it will create an email with the attachment and the subject out of a list, so it actually would change from every email and would send it through that server to a new recipient and would do it on every email in the list. The advantage of such viruses is that First of all, they didn't need Microsoft Outlook being installed. They were developed as a binary. Code was more sophisticated. And very often they were not only email worms, but also network worms at the same time and would spread themselves not only by sending emails, but also by um, copying themselves in the shared folders or spreading through peer-to-peer uh, -peer network like Kaza and so on. While rats and backdoors were not specifically dominant type of malware between 2000 and 2005, I have to note that there are some experimentation that already started around that time. A very common architecture of rats were invented where the server would be installed on a victim and the client would be actually under um, actor's control. So to control the, such rat, the client would connect to the server and start to send commands uh, to execute pretty much anything on a remote machine, remote infected machine. As I mentioned, that was not a dominant malware type, but there were already a few uh, families which represented that class of malware. As you probably noticed, most of the emerging malware families of that period of time were built as a portable executable. That means that antivirus product could apply very similar techniques to recognize and detect such malware and remove it from the system. While that's true, it's also very important to note that network worms presented a specific issue. Antivirus product on the endpoint cures the network worm. It actually doesn't solve vulnerability which that worm exploited to infect the system in the first place. If worm is still alive inside the network, it easily can reinfect the system if system if vulnerability was not patched in the system. And that happened all over time. Time, even though when antiviruses would already have um, a signature or detection or different type of detection for known worms, they would still continue spread over and over again in a, both local network and on internet in general because there were still plenty of vulnerable systems and even though the system would be cleaned, it would be reinfected again. You might notice that actually that hasn't really changed much since even in our modern times, we, we face very similar issue every time we see a new vulnerable vulnerability. That's exactly what happens. However, we probably have much better hygiene and 
a much better uh, automatic updates nowadays than it was in 2000, 2005.